Welcome back for another episode, a new month of Fresh Start. We are so glad that y'all are joining us. Uh, the idea behind this podcast is just for us to get together and bounce ideas off each other, talk about Jesus, sh- share some funny stories, and give you a fresh start to your month. Um, we're, we're targeting 6th to 12th graders and their parents. Uh, our, our youth leaders are volunteers. Uh, and we are so excited that we're back again, the four of us, for another month of Fresh Start. So yeah, so this is October, the big month of Halloween and costumes and candy. And so this month, we're going to kind of focus on the topic of removing the masks. Now, you're probably thinking, are you talking about the COVID masks or what? We're more talking about the same idea of like as you would put on a Halloween costume and you put on a mask to uh, hide your true self and to dress up. We do that so often in our day-to-day lives. Uh, We are one person around this group, we're a different person around this group, and so we're going to be talking about removing the masks today. But before we do that, with it being October and with us kind of uh, thinking about Halloween, Alex has prepared for us uh, a Halloween candy taste test that me, Zach, and Matt are going to do. And so we're going to dive into that, see if we can guess some Halloween candy here. Yeah, so we have um, a total of six candies in each of their buckets. They're going to be combined together. Two of them will be. They'll have to guess which two candies are combined together. And then I'm going to give you some interesting uh, money statistics on each of these candies about how much they've sold in dollars and all that fun stuff. So um, I'm going to... A couple of these I'll have to just drop in your mouth because we weren't able to um, <laughs> combine them in any way. Like but a mother the, bird and her little um, chicks. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> we just cover our eyes. <laughs> yeah, are exactly. your hands clean? I don't want the COVID. Um, I think they are. I hope you are. Yeah, Patient know. zero over here. Yeah. All right, so uh, make sure your eyes are closed. This first one you'll be able to you know, put in your own mouth. Just make sure your eyes are closed. So, all right. Um, all right, are you going to count us down on when to do it? Yeah. I can already feel it's kind of melted. Oh, boy. A little gooey. All right, count us down. Oh, hold up. We got one more. I can Ready? smell it. Three, two, one. Pop them. Oh, there's a Skittle. <laughs> You're not supposed to tell us when. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're supposed to guess. I have my guess. This one's really easy. Okay. All right, what you got, Matt? Of course, it's Reese's. Okay, and what else? There's a skill in there. Yeah, okay, there's one for one. There are definitely a Reese's and yeah, Skittle. Yeah, Reese's and Skittle. Okay, can you guess what flavor of Skittle? Mm. Oh. I'm going grape. You had a grape Skittle. You did. Boom! Um, I wasn't like... There was too much Reese's. I'm going to say mine was uh, yellow. It was lemon. Hey, hey, hey. All right, Matt, no pressure. Hey, it was cherry. Oh, oh. Look at that. Three for three. Good job. All right, here we go. We eat too much candy, y'all. Yeah. I got to clean the palate. All right. So here is the next one. Is this the one your mom yeah. is burning Yeah, us? you're going to. Oh, I'm excited birding. for this. So I uh, just. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather me just. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was uncomfortable. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, I don't want to touch your teeth. Dump your head back. <laughs> Matt, dump your head back. There, there, that's what I'm talking about. All right, and. <laughs> uh, let's see. I have my guess. <laughs> Uh, hold on, I'm trying Again, to another here. easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uncomfortable. All right, dump your head back for me. No, back, like, look, that's what I'm talking about. Again, there we go. All right. Don't tell us if we're right or not, because okay. you told us with Matt. So I'm guessing a Twizzler and a Kit Kat. Okay. Twizzler, Kit Kat. Mm-hmm. Twizzler, Kit Kat. All right, there we go. We're three for three. Again, it was a Twizzler and a Kit Kat. So that first, uh, the first two, the Reese's and the Skittle. Reese's sold fifty-two million dollars in Reese's last year wow, alone. For oh, you're just cheating again. Um, alone, <laughs> um, and Skittles sold thirteen point seven million dollars in Skittles God. last year. That's a lot of guacamole. It is. This one, Kit Kats, thirty-six million dollars. In Kit Kats last year and Twizzlers, this one's crazy. I would not expect this. $60.8 million in Twizzlers. Whoa. I would expect that to be Reese's, but that's crazy. So, all right, here's the last one, the last combination. You want to mama, mama bird this one too? I'm going to have to mama bird this Man, one I love this. Yeah, all right, here we go. <laughs> Can I, like, take you, like, to oh, a restaurant? Come on. Oh, hold up, hold up. Let me just... Okay. 
I didn't see what it was. Okay, that's good. Oh. Matt does not like it. Matt, you can drop your head now. <laughs> 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 Matt's just staring at the ceiling. Oh, I dropped it again. <laughs> I, I heard it hit the floor. <laughs> <laughs> it's under your leg. It's under your leg. How am I supposed to get it? It's to my teeth. This is a disaster. <laughs> it's a oh. disaster. All right. <laughs> Oh, you just right. Wood got um, close and personal. I, I don't know what happened to yours, Ryan. I didn't have another one. I'm sorry. Um, that didn't go as well as I was hoping. Oh, I got this. You missed. I know what this one is. Yeah. <laughs> I only got one. I got a Jolly Rancher and like one of those like Whopping Burger things. Yes. Yeah. A Whopping <laughs> Burger. <laughs> I only we, got a, we got a Mother Bird and a Whopping Bird. I only got a Whopper. <laughs> yeah, a Whopper. Yeah, well, I did not get a Jolly, Jolly Rancher. Rancher. I got a blue Jolly Rancher. Yeah, Ryan's Jolly Rancher sucked my finger and flung halfway across the room. <laughs> so, um, sorry. He almost fish hooked Mine me. Was definitely All y'all in podcast land, you're going to have to watch the video on that one. That was wild. Yep. Um, he definitely fish hooked me. <laughs> <laughs> he caught a big one. Put that <laughs> one on your wall. All right. So you guys are right. You have a you have a guess on what flavor Jolly Rancher that was? I was blue. Mine was definitely. Are we done with this game? Can I eat the rest of it? Yeah, you can eat the rest of it. What do you think yours was? Cherry. Sure. They were both blue raspberries. So Serious? yeah, we got a Whopper blue raspberry. So Whoppers eleven point six million dollars last year in sales, and Jolly Ranchers forty five million dollars in candy sales. That's pretty crazy. That is crazy. So Halloween candy, uh, I like to eat it. Um, it's a good guess thing. You'll have to do this attempt at home. You know, we've been doing these games, so that'll be a game you can play with your family. Tag us in your attempts at FBC Lex Students. We'd love to see your blind Halloween candy taste test. Uh, send them in your results. We want to see that happen. So we've kind of talked about what our topic's going to be for the month. We've done some Halloween candy taste tests. So as we are talking about or thinking about masks and Halloween and all of those, uh, one of the most popular things, one of my favorite things about Halloween are scary movies. And we've all experienced some different scary uh, instances in our lives. And so, uh, Alex, why don't you tell your story first, then Zach, then I'll tell mine. So when I was in middle school, I guess it was probably seventh or eighth grade, I was really avid at two things. One, collecting knives, and two, shooting people with airsoft guns. <laughs> so, how, did you, how did you turn out not to go to jail? Yeah, hey, I'm here That's somehow by the grace of God. So, here we are. I had a big pocket knife collection that I was obsessed with. I love to play airsoft. And one night, um, I'm. it's probably like midnight, 1, 2 a.m., I don't know, it's pretty late at night. Um, I just hear our back door creak open and it was loud. Our back door was super loud and like it needed some WD-40 which was never put on it. You could hear that thing from all the way across the house. And so I hear this door just creak open in the middle of the night. It wakes me straight out of my bed. I'm like, what in the world is going on? And I hear somebody walking through our kitchen because our back door was at our kitchen. And this person, is, to my knowledge, there wasn't anybody supposed to be coming over. It was just my mom, my dad, and myself. And I hear someone walking through our kitchen toward my bedroom. And I'm like, oh my gosh, someone's coming in to get me. Like, I'm freaking out. And that I means straight to my mind, all of the, like, America's Top Most Wanted that we used to watch in Criminal Minds and all this stuff. Clearly, the end goal is I'm being kidnapped and going to be taken from my parents. So I'm trying to think <laughs> of a plan of how I'm going to stop this person from kidnapping me or stealing or breaking into our house. And they come walking past my door and then go down the hall to the spare room. There's nothing in our spare room. There's an old empty safe, but like, there's nothing in there. What are they doing? They're a thief. They don't know. <laughs> I know exactly. So I'm confused. Then they come back and walk up, back up the hallway, back into the kitchen. At this point, I'm like fumbling around trying to find something I can use, and I find my little airsoft pistol and pocket knife, and I'm like, got it. This is how we're going to do this. So, whoever this person was that I had no idea walks to our refrigerator and opens the fridge. I'm like. What is it? Are they trying to steal some leftovers or some Gatorade or what's going on here? Do they need some milk? Like, I'll give you a glass of milk if you just leave my house. I don't care. But anyway, they get into the refrigerator, find what they're looking for, and come walking back to my room. And in my head, I'm like, this is the moment. This is when I'm going to get them. <laughs> it's about to go. I, <laughs> Good job, Kevin. <laughs> I am going to shoot this person in the face with an airsoft gun. It's going to stun them, and then I'm going to have my backup pocket knife just in case I got to take them out. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I was going to do it. So I, I creak open my door real slowly. Who's ever walking around comes to the corner, and right as they come to the corner, I swing around. I mean, I look around the corner, 
and face to face, I am with my 65 year old grandma <laughs> staring at me in the face. She screams bloody murder. I scream bloody murder. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't shoot her or stab her in the face because she was like shorter than me. So I was right in her face. All the lights come on in my house. My mom and dad come running out of their bedroom over to figure out what's going on. And we all figure out that no one informed me my grandma was staying the night that night. Um, <laughs> she had some things to do and she wasn't going to make it all the way back home. So. I was terrified, my grandma was terrified, and we all had a good little scare moment where I almost shot her in the face. <laughs> well, mine revolves around a scary movie called Hide and Seek. Great movie. Uh, you would know because we watched it together. We did. And you're in, you're in this story. <laughs> you see, I'm the guy that I will run into a house and not think twice about it, you know, at work, or I'll approach a car at midnight by myself, not think twice about it. But I hate scary movies. <laughs> I cannot stand them. The music gets me, like the anticipation jumping. I just don't like it. So me and Ryan and a couple of our friends, are, we're in Dixon at your house, and we're watching this movie called Hide and Seek. I'm not going to tell you all about the movie. Just know that it's really good, and y'all need to watch it. I recommend it. But anyway, so there's a couple of times that I, you know, I scream, you know, I, and I'm on edge. Uh, well, we finish the movie, and we go upstairs to Ryan's room, and in Dixon in his house. And for some reason, I was behind you, uh, and you were getting in your closet to do something. I maybe I think you were getting like an air mattress out, and. Um, as Ryan, and I mean, this is like, we're talking 1.30 in the morning probably, roughly. And I don't do well after midnight, if y'all know that. Like, I'm the guy that I'm trying to pass out at like 9 o'clock at night. So I'm already on edge because I'm tired and exhausted. Well, Ryan is <laughs> reaching around in his closet and a box shifts and falls. <laughs> so I two-hand shove Ryan in the back into the closet and I ran and jumped on his bed and got in the fetal position. <laughs> uh, so I was freaked out. So we have that going on. Next thing is in the movie there's a random time that this guy wakes up every single night and looks at the clock and it's always the same time. So we go to bed and uh, I would. I woke up, and I was like, Zach, don't look at the clock. Zach, do not look at the clock. And I am not kidding you. Hand on the Bible. I looked at the clock, and it was the same time that that guy woke up in the in the movie. And I just stared at the ceiling the rest of the night. I, I was done between the between the closet and the clock. I was done. Was this a submission video you gave to? Join the academy. <laughs> no, <laughs> gave it him this, said, do not do not send that me. clip anywhere. Because uh, I mean, this is like mid college for me. You're probably I was probably senior in high school. Senior yeah. in high school. I weigh a whole hundred and thirty pounds. He two hand shoves me. It's dark, mind you. Like there's no lights on, and I'm going to try to find the light. <laughs> I don't know. And when I do flip on the light, there is six foot four. 200 plus pound Zach in the fetal position on your bed on my bed about in tears so <laughs> that's always my so mine and it all stems around my house maybe you know the house in Dixon needs you know some like christening or you know cleansing a, yeah cleansing a pastor going in praying over it or something but so Probably the scariest I've been in my life uh, same house in Dixon my parents house I'm in high school uh me and one of my friends uh, come home. We had been out at another friend's house watching a UFC fight. And we get in. Uh, we're playing Call of Duty, like one of the early ones down on uh, uh, the TV in our downstairs living room. You know, it's a loud game, Call of Duty, one of the loudest games probably that any you know PlayStation or Xbox has to offer. So we've done that for an hour or so. It's 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. You know what you do when you're in high school and you're, it's a weekend and you got a bunch of guys over. So we go upstairs and like the way that it's laid out at my parents' house is like on the far end was my bedroom and my brother's. And the other end of the house, of the upstairs, is my parents' room and beside that is the bathroom. And so I'm going to the bathroom before I go to bed. Go to the bathroom and I hear like my parents talking in the room beside it. And uh, as I'm leaving the bathroom, like their doors are side by side and their bedroom doors open and I hear, hello, I peek my head through their door. Again, dark, it's night. Peek my head through the door and was like, hey mom, hey dad, it's me, I'm home. And my mom goes, oh Danny, 
uh, stop, it's Ryan, put the gun down. So my eyes in that moment adjust to the darkness and I just see my dad pointing a revolver <laughs> right at me through the door. I about pass out, about throw up. I mean, I almost <laughs> died, didn't realize it. So I go walking back into my bedroom and my friend who was there was like, what happened to you? Like, I'm pale, I'm shaking, and I'm like, I just almost died. Like, So that's my scare story. It had nothing to do with Halloween or ghosts or goblins or ghouls, but make sure your parents know you're coming home, especially if your dad has a gun in the nightstand beside the bed, because if not, you might get stabbed or shot with Alex or <laughs> might crawl up in a fetal position like Zach. Or you might almost I've grown up a lot. <laughs> I've grown up. Maybe. So um, kind of talking about all this and just continuing and transitioning and all of that, uh, a story from the Bible that we're going to look at happens in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. Uh, and it's Paul writing to the church at Corinth about Moses and how Moses had uh, put a mask or a veil over his face and some things that maybe Moses faced to make him do this uh, and things that you and I face today and just some different ways that we can overcome uh, these different pressures on putting on these masks. So again, we're going to read here 2 Corinthians three twelve through 18. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at him at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when, ter when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we are all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So a lot of times we hear this grand story of Moses about how he received the Ark of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments and all these things comes down from the glory um, at Mount Sinai when he encounters God. And we think he's got to put this veil over his face because God's glory is just so outstanding and fantastic that, that it can't be shown to all of the Israelites. But Paul shines a little light on the subject here and talks about how really Moses put this veil over his face because he was embarrassed um, of that he was dwindling, that the godliness and the holiness that was poured onto him was dwindling and going away, and he didn't want others to see that. And there was a lot of pressure um, as Moses was the leader of the largest developing nation of the time, God's people, and to have a certain image to uphold. And today we're going to talk about some of those pressures that um, we may face to hold a certain image or a certain mask that we can remove in order to be um, a more authentic Christian and a more authentic person. But I think one of the big um, issues that we see here that Moses is facing that is really um, something that we face a lot of times is pressures from family and pressures from parents. The Israelites were Moses' family. They were his bloodline, um, the people who he was leading, who he loved, who he raised, who he was raised around. And he had a lot of pressure to live up to their expectations, to live up to their thoughts of him. And family pressures can be a really difficult thing, just like Moses. I think of my own family life. I grew up in a split household, and maybe you're somewhere like that too. Maybe you grew up in a fully Christian household. Maybe neither of your you know, parents are Christians, or maybe it was like me where you have one parent who's a Christian, goes to church, and the other parent doesn't. And don't get me wrong, I love my family. I would do anything for them. They are a lot of great people. But as we know, people who do not go to church and who aren't Christians have, don't have certain understandings and reasons for why things happen and why we do things as Christians and those who do. And I can remember growing up that um, the side of my family, particularly my father and um, some of his family, would always encourage me to do well in school and do well in sports and this sort of thing, which isn't a wrong thing. I think it's you know a really good um, idea to push students um, and their children to do well. Um, but it was the idea behind it. Why do you want me to make good grades? Why do you want me to do well in sports? And it wasn't you know to bring glory to God. It wasn't 
to have a platform to share my testimony. For him, it was, okay, this is how you're going to get into college, which again, that's not a bad thing in and of itself, but it wasn't just so you can get into college. It was so you can get into college, graduate with a degree that you can make a lot of money and you can be happy, right? The ultimate goal for people who don't know Christ is, you know, let's live the American dream. Let's be happy. Let's do your own thing. And there was a lot of pressure from my father and that side of my family um, to be a certain kind of person. And I think a lot of times um, students face that same family pressure of, you find yourself living under your parents' dreams and what they want for you. You find yourself doing the sports that your parents want you to play. You find yourself maybe even being pressured to go to a certain college that your parents went to or you know, joining clubs and organizations that your parents were a part of. And they really try to pressure you into acting and being a certain person when in reality on the inside, they may think that they're doing and hoping for what's best for you because I think that's what all parents are but on the inside you feel as though you were just living a, a lie that you were living um, as a different person than who you feel you are in Christ and I think that is one of our strongest pressures is, is family members because they are the ones who we love the most and who we take their input um, the, the strongest and who we want to listen to and be like so if our parents um, don't go to church or they aren't Christians or our family doesn't go to church and aren't Christians, sometimes it's difficult to go against what our parents are saying, even if we know um, that that's what Christ is calling us to. Yeah. So pressures of family, that's definitely a big one. But another pressure that Moses faced and that you and I face is the pressure of self-worth. Uh, we are sometimes our biggest critics or our uh, the hardest on ourselves when everybody else uh, isn't. So Zach's going to give us a little bit on pressures of self-worth. Yeah, I think self-worth is probably, uh, next to family, is probably one of the biggest things that um, anybody faces, especially um, our target audience. Um, take, take my iPhone sitting right here on the table, for example. Uh, this right here is worth $700. That's what I paid for it because that's what Apple says it's worth. That's what the creator of this phone says this phone is worth. And we think about our self-worth. What does our creator say we're worth? Well, we're worth Jesus to God. I mean, he literally gave his one and only son. We read about it in church um, here recently, you know, for God so little that he gave his only son. We are worth Jesus to God. And so what does that look like in our lives? You know, I think about, I've heard, uh, I've heard of uh, people tell me that they sit down with girls and they say, well, he's told me that if I'll just put out, he'll love me. Like, no, you're worth so much more than that. Uh, ladies, if you're listening to this and a guy tells you that you have to do a certain thing for him to love you, that is not love at all. That, that is absolutely the complete opposite of that. You're worth Jesus to God. And, and if we can ever find our true self-worth, and we find that in Jesus only, and who Jesus says that we are, who he says we're worth. We talked about identity in our last podcast. Once we find our self-worth, a lot of the pressures go away. Um, a lot of the pressures within your relationships go away. I think about guys that I've sat down with and talked to, whether it be at basketball practice or in a Sunday school classroom setting or after that, and I'm just giving them a ride somewhere and we just start talking. You know, they tell me, man, I want to fit in, so I'm going to go to this party and I'm going to get drunk and I'm going to get high and I'm going to do these things. Why? Because they're, they're trying to find their worth in the world. We don't, we don't look for our worth in the world. We look for our worth in who the Word says that we are in what Jesus says that we are. So when we get to this, this crossroad of who am I and what, what do I want to stand for, it comes back to what are we worth? You know, God says that we are worth Jesus. Jesus hung on a cross with his arms spread wide to say, I love you this much. And that's what we're worth. And so when we get that, when we understand that, man, pressure starts looking a whole lot different. Yeah. So there's pressures from fa family. There's pressures from ourselves. Uh, there's pressures from others. There's peer pressure. Yeah, I fell under, I fell under a lot of peer pressure from multiple different things, from people that I was around telling me that I need to do these things, like get into partying or drugs, alcohol. When at the end of the day, that's, what, that's not who it was, or you fall up under a pressure of people on social media. You compare yourselves to them, you fall up under the peer pressure of, I want to be like them, you know, I want to have this or that. And you fall up under that whenever, like whenever Zach was just, was just talking about self-worth, 
you know, your word, Jesus, to God. And, you know, you fall up under that pressure of, I want all these things, but it's not really who you are. It's God leading you towards, like, what you really are. I used to fall up under it all the time, compare myself to everyone, and was not ever happy doing it at all. And if you stop falling up, up, up under that peer pressure of, I want to be like that, or, you know, let people influence you in the wrong way, it's just something that you, you know, once you start stop falling up under that, you know, you start to realize, like, my self-worth and my peer pressures are not what I'm making it to be. My worth is in Jesus. My peer pressures should be coming from Jesus, not other people. Hmm. That's all I have. Yeah, and so uh, there's pressures from family. There's pressures of self-worth. There's peer pressure. Uh, we're now going to hear from some leaders in the community that you're probably very familiar with as they just kind of share with us their view and their aspect kind of outside of the teen life, even outside of the church life, and how they see peer pressures from teenagers. My name is Whitney Owens, and I'm the principal of Lexington Middle School. My name is Peyton Buckley, and I'm the assistant principal at Lexington Middle School. And we would like to thank Ryan Keaton and Alex Williams for having us out today to talk to you about social pressures and difficult things that a lot of our students go through on a regular basis. Ms. Owens? At this time, I would like to talk about what some of our female students face, and one of the things that I would like to talk about is social media. Um, as you can see, a lot of our students are on TikTok, um, they have Snapchat, and some kids tend to deal with Facebook, but not that much. Uh, one of the things that I see that students um, are faced with is, as the likes go up, that means a lot to them. And so one of the things that I want to say to students is this, it does not matter about likes. Um, it tends to cause anxiety, stress, wearing, and God ha does not want us to stress or he does not want us to worry. Um, he did not create us to live a life like that. So one of the things that um, I encourage parents to do is to have conversations with your children about what they are looking at um, or what the social media apps that they have on their phones. I also encourage you to put down your phones uh, and to spend quality time with them. Um, some of the things that social media does um, to kids is um, we find ourselves not listening to our kids. We need to spend quality time, um, read a book, watch TV together, go to a movie, go outside, you know, have a family uh, game night, do some things that are actually meaningful. Um, you know, you come to church and you have that worship together, but uh, there's worship that you can have inside of your house too. Okay. Uh, to piggyback on what Miss Owens had to say, <clears throat> what I deal with on a regular basis and what we see uh, with boys and the social pressures are a lot of identity issues. Do I fit in with this group? Am I going to be included with that clique? And it brings about so many issues and problems, uh, emotional for these students. And parents, I would encourage also, encourage your boys to open up and talk about it. Uh, a lot of times we think uh, being tough guys, we can't open up and share our feelings and emotions and we hold those in and we bottle them up until they build and build and become bigger problems. So parents, I encourage you to have those tough conversations uh, with your boys at home um, because they have some of the same emotions as girls do. We just don't display them on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> I'd also say um, today going with the social media with her, um, when they're not involved with activities, they know about it because of social media. And that's really hard even for guys. They know when there's an outing, a party, uh, various things, they know about it right away. And uh, it really takes a toll on them. And uh, you wouldn't think that guys would go through that, but they do. Um, more boys, this is a statistic, uh, you could look it up, more boys die by suicide than girls. Um, and that's a scary factor. So once again, I encourage you, and going back to identity, I encourage you to find your identity in Jesus Christ. Um, one of my favorite passages is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, where God tells you to cast your anxieties unto him because he cares for you. And I encourage you parents to talk to your kids and um, just lift them up and teach them about the love of Christ. All throughout his word, there's not a single perfect person 
Everyone goes through something, and, uh, and that's okay. So thanks again for First Baptist Church, Ryan Keaton, Alex Williams, for having us to talk about issues that our students face each and every day. Thank you. So we're thankful that not only us sitting at this table, but that there are many leaders involved with our church and many leaders just out in the community who love students, who are wanting to pour into students. And so we're thankful for any kind of feedback. We're thankful for any kind of uh, adult leadership who's wanting to pour into this next generation and to lead them. And so uh, we've talked about these pressures. So the pressures of family, the pressures of self-worth, peer pressure. So how do you remove these pressures? So we're talking about this idea of removing the mask. How can you be somebody who isn't uh, walking around and you're one person at school, you're one person to the basketball team, you're one person to the beta club, you're one person at band, you're one person at church, you're one person with your family, you're one other person when you're at home. You know, that's exhausting. Trying to uh, be all of these different people, trying to be a chameleon who just uh, blends in with their environment. and. If I could describe my life, I mean, I lived for Jesus. I went to church. I grew up in church. I was very involved in church. Uh, I was involved in a lot of different organizations at school, Christian organizations, but I still wanted to fit in. And so how do you start removing these pressures? I would say first, uh, and it's things that y'all have already talked about, but just be careful who you allow to speak into your life. Uh, because the crazy thing is, it could be a family member, it could be a boyfriend or girlfriend, it could be a coach, uh, but sadly not everybody in your life is going to be telling you advice that you need to listen to. Uh, I'm very thankful that I had good, godly Christian parents who uh, motivated me through the lens of Jesus, but that's not everybody's story. And sadly, especially working with students, I see that that's actually the exception rather than the rule. And so there are a lot of parents, like Alex talked about, who um, have selfish goals in mind. They're trying to live vicariously through their kids. And so they're picking career paths or um, they're picking extracurricular activities that, and you as a student, you're not even really that passionate about, but you don't want to disappoint your parent. Or like Zach was talking about, you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend who is trying to get you to live in a way. Just be careful who you allow to speak into your life. And and start using wisdom. This is something, you know, when you get in sixth grade, middle school, high school, uh, especially into adult life, you really need to start figuring out who are your true friends and who are just there to get something from you or out of you. And uh, man, one of the biggest things in my life of learning is just to know who to go to for advice. I have a lot of friends and I have a lot of people I hang out with, and then I have even less number of people that I talk to about really difficult things, but then I have even less people of, if I'm really trying to get advice that I go to and say, hey, what do you think I need to do about this situation? So don't just let anybody speak into your life. I would say the second way that you can remove the pressures is be careful what you allow into your life. So not only speaking into your life, but just what you're around. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of the Bible is talking about you have to be in the world and you're not supposed to be of the world. But a lot of times we uh, more say, well, yeah, I'm going to the parties, but I'm not drinking. I'm just going to be a DD or I'm just going to make sure my friends don't get into trouble or whatever. Man, I've, I've learned this from experience. You know, uh, you've all you've probably heard, you know, you can't lay with the dogs and not get up without fleas like you're going to eventually the things are going to rub off on you, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, it could even be as simple as the music you're listening to or the movies that you're watching. I know for me, for example, like a majority of my life, man, I would just have horrible dreams, like nightmares. And I, I really did. I enjoy horror movies and scary movies. But once I like cut that out of my life and don't watch them as much, like my thoughts and the things that used to like scare me, even though like it's simple, like foolish things, like I didn't allow those things to just be in my mind. And it's crazy how even is something as simple as my dreams whenever I'm asleep at night, I feel like I can actually rest. And so you might be saying, oh, I'm just listening to the music for the beat. Well, the lyrics are pouring into your life too, whether you realize it or not. And you see that come out when you're frustrated. You see that come out when you stub your toe or when you're just sitting in your room and your thoughts are going on. And, and that adds pressures in your life. That starts becoming part of the filter that you filter everything else through. And then I think another big thing is, man, just continue to stay in God's Word and let His Word define you. Like, like Zach has talked about and Matt and Alex, 
Like, there are so many pressures and there's so many people that are trying to say, you are this. And so we start putting on their mask. Well, this person has said I'm this, so um, I'm worthless unless I do this, or I'm ugly unless I do this, or I'm whatever unless you do these certain things. And just take the pressure of, man, you don't have to be anything other than who God has called you to be. You're his child, and start leaning into that. You're in middle school, you're in high school, maybe you're even a parent or a leader watching this, and you spent your whole life trying to be what everybody else has wanted you to be. God has gifted you with your own set of skills and abilities and your wants and your desires that are unique to you, almost like your fingerprint, your identity and who you are in Christ is unique to yourself. And so I think a big way to remove the pressure is just to lean into that. Lean into who you are in Christ and stop trying to be somebody else that you're not. So some questions were submitted, some questions to think about as we end this podcast, as we kind of wrap up on the idea of moving the mask. So uh, the first question that's going to be answered is, what was a big struggle for you in school? I alluded to this answer a little bit as we were talking about family pressures, but I think one of my biggest personal struggles in school is what I let define who I was. Um, With the family pressures and the friend pressures came me trying to decide who I was, and so for me, my sports, which particularly was wrestling, became what I wanted to be known for. I didn't care if people knew that I was a Christian. I didn't care that people knew that I went to church. I didn't care if people knew anything else about me. But if they knew that I was a varsity starter on the wrestling team, was going to make an impact on my wrestling team, and that I was going to go to college and be a great college wrestler, that's all I cared about. And so I, no pun intended, wrestled with um, for so long who I actually was. Um, And so one of my biggest maybe regrets or mistakes in high school was being defined by my sports and my academics and not letting Christ work through me in a way that I could use those sports and those academics um, for the sake of impacting others for Jesus. Yeah. Another question that was asked is, how do you stay motivated to lead others for Jesus? Man, first off, I think if, if we're going to actually even answer that question, you have to first be a Christian. Um, if you don't have a desire to tell someone about Jesus, there's a strong chance you've never met him yourself. Um, so, uh, but for me, I, I use my work, and I use that term loosely because I, I wear a lot of different hats. I have a lot of different uh, jobs. But my, main, my day job is law enforcement. Um, and I, I love to pull up next to a... a to one of my, my coworkers, and man, even if it's just a 30 second conversation that I get to tell you about Jesus, then, you know, to see the wheel start turning. Um, or just real quickly, I'll tell you a story about a guy that I made a traffic stop on one night. Um, I cut him a, a big time break, a um, couple hundred dollars in court. And I told him when I went and basically was like, hey, look, I could do this to you, but I'm not. When I finished, I said, you know, God's given me a lot of mercy in my life. I'm going to give you some tonight. And just that little witness right there, the guy starts crying in front of me. And he says, man, my dad's a preacher, and he's been telling me I need to wake up. He said, you just woke me up. So just things like that, man, the the, the seeing people, the, the wheels start turning, man, it, it, it motivates you. It really does. Yeah. What is one goal you are working to achieve right now? Uh, one goal I'm working to achieve right now is mainly my education to get my GED so I can get into college and go into what I feel like God's been calling me to do besides Bible vocational ministry, which is law enforcement, to give me another opportunity to share the gospel because I'm already doing it through youth ministry and through being an intern here at the church. So that's one goal that I have mainly right now. And then the last question is, what is one thing you wish you could tell your younger self? Uh, One thing I try to tell myself even right now, but one thing I wish I could go back is just enjoy the moment that you're in right now. Uh, You spend so much of your life waiting for the next season that you forget to enjoy the season you're in right now. So when you're in sixth grade, man, I can't wait till I get in high school. When you're in high school, I can't wait till I can drive. Once you can drive, I can't wait till I get to college. Once you're in college, you're like, man, I can't wait till I get a job. Once you get a job, you're like, man, I wish I was watching cartoons, eating cereal again and not having any responsibilities. Like. Just enjoy the season you're in. No matter what age you are right now, like I don't want to sound like a country song, but like you're going to miss this. Like you're going to miss the season you're in right now. I know that it might seem difficult or it might seem boring or whatever, 
but like enjoy the friends that you're around, enjoy the people in your house that you're with, whether it's a sibling or your parents or a guardian, the friends that you have right now, like your life is gonna change. So don't spend so much time wishing for change that you forget to enjoy the life you're living in. Just enjoy the moment and uh, man, all that other stuff will come. You will get to high school one day. You will get your license one day. You will go to college or join the workforce one day, but just enjoy where you're at. Enjoy the people you're around and don't be so overwhelmed that you feel like you have to take on all these pressures, put on all these masks to make yourself somebody you're not or to fulfill somebody else's dreams for you that you don't have. So man, just enjoy the moment. Again, we want to thank you. We launched this podcast, the full version of it, the first of every month. And so make sure to check it out on all podcast networks and platforms on YouTube. And then we release weekly clips on Instagram, Facebook, so you can check that out as well. Thank you again uh, on behalf of me, Ryan, and Zach, and Alex, and Matt. We want to thank you for joining in for session two of our Fresh Start podcast. We'll see you next month. Have a good one.